It had been four decades since the woman's suffrage measure first had been brought to the New York legislature, and the one and only popular referendum ever held in the state in 1915 had been bitterly defeated. But Carrie Chapman Catt had been working 12 to 14 hour days all year, with her winning plan always in her sights. Carrie Chapman Catt was looking at 36 states. We need ratification by 36 states. She was focused on lobbying members of Congress. She was meeting with Woodrow Wilson to try to win him over. Cat puts a lot of stock in Wilson's support, and she cultivates that relationship with him. Over the course of 1917, Cat and Wilson exchange 30 letters. Almost every other week, they're writing back and forth to one another. She's counting on him to weigh in with governors and legislators in key states. Though the president remained staunch in his opposition to a federal amendment, he'd obligingly thrown his weight behind Katz's state campaigns. Thanks to his influence and the tireless efforts of thousands of unsung heroines on the ground, five states recently had followed the Illinois example and extended either presidential suffrage or primary suffrage to women, dramatically enhancing their political clout. A victory in New York, the most populous state in the country, would add as many as 45 pro-suffrage votes in Congress. And the National Association had pulled out all the stops to secure them. For months on end, suffragists had tramped over the nearly 50,000 square miles of the state, collecting signatures door to door. An enormous campaign coalition had been built, comprised not only of working class and immigrant women, but also, crucially, African American women, many of whom had been actively working for the ballot for years. Through black women's clubs, equal suffrage leagues, the NAACP, and who were able to tap a population of male voters too sizable to ignore. When we focus on the national story, we see the near impossibility of black and white women working in tight and equal coalition with one another. But in a place like New York City, things are possible that are not possible on a national scale. And when African American women see an opening, they are prepared to mobilize their clubs into real political power. Most promising to Kat was the continued return on her investment with President Wilson, who publicly expressed his hope that the people of New York will realize the great occasion that faces them on election day and respond to it in a noble fashion. Tammany Hall, the powerful democratic machine that dominated New York City politics, was quick to follow Wilson's lead and on the eve of the election, reversed its longtime opposition to woman suffrage. If you are a politician, you don't want to stake out a strong position on a losing side where you're in opposition to people who might become enfranchised anyway, especially a lot of people, like half the population. So that what happens at that point when they're looking at the end game, they say, let's get on the bandwagon. On election night, as newsboys roamed the streets below hawking late editions, Carrie Chapman Catt stood in a window of the National Association's headquarters on Fifth Avenue and watched as the building that housed the anti-suffrage times flashed its rooftop spotlight, a signal that the women of New York at last had won the right to vote. At a victory celebration the next day, before an auditorium packed to the rafters, Kat opened her remarks with the words, fellow citizens. What came next was drowned out by cheers. But Kat had no time for jubilation. She'd already turned her mind to what lay ahead. The victory is not New York's alone, she declared. It's the nation's. 
the 65th Congress will now pass the federal amendment. Cat called the New York victory the Gettysburg of suffrage, meaning it was the battle that turned the tide. But it wasn't the battle that ended the war.